right, this is great. Uh, part three here. Um, used to have to wait a long time for these things to upload, but I've got my laptop going with my last recording, and now I'm using my Mac for the next one so that while one's uploading, I can make another one instead of waiting around forever. Um, okay, but that aside, let's see. Let's return back to these uh, slides. I, I really do like this one. Um, what feeling it evokes, I can't quite say, and that's okay, because romantics sort of want, want you to have that, that a feeling that you might not be able to express in a neat packaged way. Um, they want you to go into the feelings and experience perhaps a little taste of the sublime. Um, some of you have a have a notion of what the sublime means. Um, we'll talk. Ask me about that. We'll talk more about that. Very important um, aspect of romanticism. <laughs> I just had to include this one. I think it's amusing, and um, in a way, um, you know, Bewick is, is is saying you know art doesn't necessarily have to be something you know, depicting just a nice little bird, it can, it can have the, the element of the grotesque or um, the um, profane, even, if you will. Uh, oh, another interesting one. Another one of my favorites. You'll notice right here, you see somebody falling off a tree branch. Now, if you'll notice, it probably broke right around there. And he was probably trying to get up in that nest, steal some eggs, but oops, comes tumbling down. And, and, and just such beautiful detail when it comes to the, the life, um, the plants, the bushes, the, the shapes of the branches, even the, the, the nature of the bark. You know, with its imperfections, it's um, the weathered quality of it all. You know, this it's not trying to depict something like perfectly perfect. It's, it's trying to show things as they are. Um, a moment in time where, you know, things break. Life is in jeopardy. Um, and this guy was, who knows why he was going after this nest, but when you... Put yourself out on a limb, you know, sometimes you pay the price. All right, so we've been through a lot of these slides, and um, there's there's a bunch more um, in G. Wick's History of Birds. Um, so this is the stuff Jane was, was looking at, and um, she, I, I want you from all of these episodes to, to take from the fact Take from these the fact that that this this work, um, the art that we we're looking and talking about, looking at and talking about right now, made a, a tremendous imprint on Bronte, and also we see that imprinting going on with Jane, who later goes on to become a pretty accomplished um, draw drawer and painter, um, but that's for her private life. You know, it's not like she becomes a famous artist. Well, I won't give away too much. So let's just review some, some takeaways. Um, let me try and move that. There we go. Um, so Thomas Bewick. I'll read the echoes of romantics, rediscovery of nature and scenery, and its emphasis on human response to beauty, power, and moods of the natural world. Um, Bewick spanned the years labeled pre-romantic and romantics from 1753 to 1828. All right, so um, moods of the natural world, that's good. A little bit ahead of its time too. I, um, so it's cool that because, um, you know, the, the big romantics come a little bit later on. People like Wordsworth, 
um, Keats, um, Shelley, Mary Shelley, Percy Shelley, I don't remember he wrote Ozymandias, um, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. So here are some romantic and also Gothic codes and constructs. Okay, Gothic, another important term. I'm not going to get into it now, but it's a certain emotional, um, emotion-based creative school where it is meant to create this sort of sense of, of awe and maybe even fear and, and sublime. And, and you, you can see the Gothic um, in architecture, but also in, in painting and in literature as well. Something we'll talk about um, as we get further into the novel, and the novel does take on specific um, Gothic elements. But what we are seeing in Bewick and, we're, and what we're going to see in Jane Eyre are, are the, the following themes, motifs. Okay, this allure of exotic, far-off landscapes. Okay, not only in Bewick is this depicted, but in, in Jane Eyre, the novel, Jane is, is one who is always longing for what might be out there beyond the confines of my limited existence. And my existence is limited because I'm an orphan, I'm poor, I'm a female, and probably some other limiting factors, but those are some big ones, okay? Class, um, you know, financial status, and um, gender. Pensive solitariness, another very common thread in romantic art. We see it in Jane Eyre. Mysterious, irrational forces, huge, okay? We're going to encounter this earlier on in the novel, probably around, I think it's chapter two, or chapter one in the red room, okay, when Jane um, encounters something that is hard to explain. Yearning for infinity, I like that. I yearn for infinity. Maybe you do too. Intense sensibility, as in sensibility, the ability to feel things intensely. And that's emphasized by romanticism. And feeling things, all the feels. Okay, the romantics were, I mean, I'm, I'm say, I'll say it some more, they're ahead of their time. Arguably the first um, environmentalists. And, and that's a lot to do with the fact that they were uh, gaining in notoriety and in the mainstream, alongside of all of these incredible industrial developments that were, were happening in, in Europe. Um, you know, steam engine, the use of coal, um, changes in farming practices, all of this created urbanization and um, a sort of a removal of, of a lot of people from living a life in the countryside that was much more simple and less urbanized. <clears throat> so, powers of imagination. Okay, that's going to be a running thread throughout Jane Eyre. Fascination with the ruins of time. Okay, we saw that in some of the slides, like the old castles and churches and, and graveyards where the gravestones are clearly tipping over because, you know, that's what happens in time. We haven't quite talked about this one very much yet, but the importance of childhood is something the romantics were, some of the romantics, this was their main um, mission, is to, to bring back the wonder uh, that, that you, you feel as a child. Well, why does that have to go away through education and maturation? Why can't one retain the ability to look at the world the way that a child does. Um, there's something magical, um, maybe even mysterious, that the child brings with him or her into the world. And by looking at that, by remembering your own childhood, 
you can gain back that magic, that connection that may have been lost um, through your experience of, of civilization and acculturation, etc. Also, the morbid graveyard strain, okay, this this recognition, this this not shying away from the fact that there there is death and decay, uh, that time does um, have its way in the end. Um, nothing is more powerful than time in, in a sense. And um, so if you want to develop your intense sensibility, okay, getting a little bit morbid, um, you know, the graveyard strain, going and hanging out in graveyards, okay, or even looking at, at pictures of, of eerie stuff, like a fiend and a thief in the moonlight, okay, this is all part of the romantic experience. Okay, I've said some of this before, but I'll just as a review. Um, you know, Charlotte and her sisters had a copy of Bewick's History of British Birds. Okay, um, I wonder, they probably had to take turns looking at it. They probably looked at it together. Also, and it's really important to note that <coughs> Charlotte and her two sisters, Emily, Anne, and they had a brother too, who um, was a bit of a libertine and that he had problems with, probably had some mental health issues, uh, perhaps. It sounds like he might have been bipolar, um, and as with a lot of bipolar people, um, with that comes um, addiction issues at times, gambling. Um, he he died as a result of, of, of that. Um, but that's just to say that, you know, Charlotte didn't live an easy life, um, other siblings of hers did die um, while she was young for health reasons related to poor living conditions. Or um, we'll learn more about you know the history of the Bronte sisters, um, but they they were all incredibly imaginative, and as as children they were already writing novels and creating whole worlds and writing about them. Um, and and the, this phenomenon of of young young authors who later then become famous, okay, we, we go back and we study what they wrote when they were younger, and that's called juvenilia. Juvenilia is, um, you know, the body of work that's left over from the childhood of a famous writer or author, artist. Um, they loved fantasy worlds, and they entertained themselves, and and, and they lived a very lonely life. They probably didn't leave the house very much. They lived on the edge of, of the moors, which were pretty empty um, and bleak. It's not like you could just sort of walk out into them indefinitely, um, you know, places that were a little bit harsh and dangerous. Um, people often got um, you know, disappeared in the moors. A moor, what is a moor? If you don't know, it's, 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 imagine a desert that's not sand um, and cacti, but more like, uh, you know, a, a very harsh, windy, no trees, um, rugged, rocky, um, maybe some bog here and there. Vegetation, of course, you know, everything in England is green, but really easy to get disoriented. Uh, once you're in the middle of it and you look around, you can't see anything, no landmarks. It's, it's, it's a very, it's almost like going out to sea um, in some ways. And um, so that, the moor, was very much part of the Brontes' worldview. And um, it definitely had to have impacted their artistic sensibilities. Um, yeah, one last thing interesting. They, they, they copied those pictures, um, and um, so that's kind of cool. Maybe that would be an interesting uh, project if any of you wanted to copy a Bewick woodcut. And, okay, I'll also say the stories that they wrote then they were, they were children, the juvenilia, well, Charlotte's um, big work of juvenilia was... Um, this universe called Ang Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Angria and Gondal were two um, places with talking animals. Um, perhaps 
uh, like Narnia, maybe C.S. Lewis lifted this content. content.